Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships, How can relationships evolve, evolve with people evolve as they grow and change? Grow and change? I was in bed with my partner and it sounded like it was raining outside. And she goes, I think that it's raining. I don't, but it shouldn't be raining. And so she looks on her phone and she's like, it says that it's not raining. I'm like we can hear it raining. Though. We can hear, we can hear it raining. She's looking at her phone and she's like, but it says that it's not raining. If it's not, if it's not on my phone, it's not real. <laughs> Welcome to the Curious Fox podcast. This podcast is for those who challenge the status quo in love sex, and relationships. My name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Misla. And today we're going to be talking about the connection between emotional intelligence and erotic wisdom with Shadeen Francis. Shadeen is a sought-after speaker, a licensed psychotherapist, and a media personality whose expertise spans the domains of sex therapy, emotional intelligence, and social justice. She's been featured on platforms like ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and the New York Times to share her unique perspective Shadeen is invited to speak internationally on topics such as sexual self-esteem, overcoming shame, relationship design. And with a background in neuroscience and radio hosting, she transforms difficult subjects into engaging and actionable steps. Whether in her office or an academic stating or a community event, all of Shadeen's work is inspired by her commitment to helping people live lives full of peace and pleasure. And Shadeen, we are thrilled to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Shadeen. It's been a trying few months for everyone. We're so happy to have you. Last time we connected, it was over, consider this, you were a speaker, consider this. Those are the times that we could all be together and, and be in community and groups. And that hasn't been the case for the last few months. I'm curious, how are you keeping sane? So <laughs> it's, it's sort of a, a split question for me. So I Ultimately, my husband and I decided to shelter in place uh, at my parents' house. And so, <laughs> you know, keeping sane is a big frame when you live with, mm. live with family again after 11 years. But I'm feeling really joyful about some of the simple pleasures of just those reconnections. I happen to be very fortunate to be close to my family. I literally call my parents my babies. They don't love it. I do it anyways. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but they cook every single meal every single day, and they're just like really really just like warm, loving, ethnic parents. Uh, and, and, and they help. They help a lot. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I'm interested in, you know, we started off this conversation by what's keeping you sane. And, you know, as we said in the start of the show, we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence <laughs> and erotic wisdom. And the emotional intelligence piece, I, I, I have a sense of, and I'm interested in exploring that more. The erotic wisdom, not as much. And so I want to explore those. But So I want to take some time first to jump into those, free, those two phrases. But before we take a deep dive into each, I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of how those two things connect. What does emotional intelligence and erotic wisdom have to do with each other? So because of the space that we're in, uh, I know that you'll humor me sort of nerding out for a moment here. Um, welcome. Welcome. We love nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some of the ways that I kind of parse out some of these terms. I kind of like to operationalize uh, the words that I use. And this doesn't mean that this is like the textbook, like hard and fast definition, just being clear about the way that I think about these words so that some of the framing might make sense um, for all of us as we have these conversations. So when I think of knowledge. Uh, I think about knowledge, the things that we know as kind of a collection of information uh, that we've acquired. Right? And there's so many ways that we can come into information. Um, and not, knowledge might also be related to like our skills, but these are the things maybe that we've learned. I think intelligence requires us to be able to like apply that knowledge. So the ways that we use and demonstrate uh, the things that we come to know. Then I think about wisdom as the embodiment 
uh, of the things that we know. So not just kind of how we do it, how we act it out, but also how we kind of live in it, right? When you think of someone who's wise, there's there's just sort of a quality about it. They don't necessarily have to like be good at any particular thing. It it almost becomes like a like a personality characteristic on some level. And so when I think about uh, how we might link emotional intelligence and uh, erotic wisdom for me, um, emotional intelligence as this way of having skillfulness around our emotions, translating in an opportunity to really inhabit our bodies in eroticism in a way that allows us to feel almost like intuitive about sex, about eroticism, about, about connection. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I can see how those are connected. So one of the things that we talk about often is this idea that emotional intelligence is, you know, it's it's a buzzword. It's something that is thrown around. You hear it from everywhere, from leadership to relationships, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has it. Just because we know what it is doesn't mean we, we have it. Uh, I'm curious to how you would, how we would cultivate it. How would we cultivate emotional intelligence? Is that, do you, you know, is it a skill? Is it a, uh, is it something that's inherent to you? I'm curious. You, I'm curious to what your take on it is. Yeah, I, I definitely think that it is a skill, and for people who sort of imagine themselves as kind of like naturally emotional intelligent, I would argue that it's just likely a skill you haven't had to be intentional about cultivating. Um, there are just lots of ways in which we can be supported around that development or unsupported in that development. And so this isn't to shame anyone who doesn't feel very sort of strong in that EQ space, right? That's the way that a lot of people might, you know, shorthand emotional intelligence in the same way that like statistical intelligence might be called IQ, right? That emotional intelligence is often referred to as EQ. And I, I like thinking about intelligence as applied knowledge because we can absolutely always learn more and unlearn things that are unhelpful and learn more deeply. So it doesn't have, always have to be a breadth of knowledge. It can also be a depth of knowledge. And then we can actually implement it, right? Being able to use those, that knowledge and skills is, you know, in, in the frame of intelligence that I like to use, how we actually sort of claim that status. And so I think the first step around emotional intelligence is really getting in touch with how you feel. Even think about like colloquially, like day to day, when you ask someone like, how are you? We respond with all sorts of, you know, non-emotions. How you doing? I'm fine. Right? Mm-hmm. Fine is not actually an emotion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? I'm okay. That's also not an emotion. And when people share actual emotions, it does feel significant because we often sort of have kind of a momentary pause, right? Someone uses like an actual feeling word. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm scared. I'm worried. I'm annoyed. That shifts the the intimacy of these sort of high and by conversations. I moved from Canada to the States. And when I first moved, uh, it was before my clinical training. So part of me felt like everyone kind of hated me because we'd have all these like just passing by conversations where people would be like, Hey, how are you? And I would like go to like give a real, you know, Canadian maple syrup answer, right? like share my actual, you know, emotional experience. And that person's already like halfway down the street. Cause they were just acknowledging my existence on the sidewalk. They weren't trying to like, have, have an emotional interaction or, or a connection in that moment. And so I think that is kind of where we need to start right around being present to our emotions in order to develop more skill in knowing them. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. Because there's something about feeling seen. And we, I often hear that from my clients. I'm, I'm sure if you feel the same, where folks are in relationship, either romantic or familial or, rela- or friendships, and they say, I don't feel seen. Mm. One of the first questions I ask is, do you see yourself? Like, are you mm-hmm. seeing your own feelings, your own emotions? Are you seeing your wholeness? Because it is challenging for people to see us when we are not willing to show ourselves, let alone see ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I completely agree with you, Jackie, on like, do you see yourself? And I think the next step from that is absolutely, do you, do you show yourself? So I think when you say I'm fine or I'm okay, that's you not showing yourself. You know, you might, even if you do know yourself, you're not willing to share where you're at. So you're not seen, you know. You've just described like half of how I've shown up in relationships in the past, <laughs> where it's like, how are you? I'm fine. 
I'm good. I'm fine. And then when they're like, great, then I'm like pissed and annoyed. You don't see me. You don't love me. You should know that fine does not mean okay. That me saying I'm good does not mean that I am actually good. Like you should know that. And each time I've been told like, you know, whoever knows goes, like if you know something about how you're feeling, you're supposed to say it. I'm like, that's craziness. If you love me, then you should know. Um, So yes, I I have had to break that, that, create a new discipline around actually saying how I feel. Some of the times when I talk to clients, I have to literally let them talk for a while and then, and, you know, I'll ask the question, how are you feeling about this? And then they'll go into, you know, and essentially intellectualized rhetoric about how they're, what they think about it. And I have to like, let them come to a point, a pause and be like, okay, now let's try again with feeling words. And then they'll go again. And then again, it's like some ramblings about, you know, uh, you know some thoughts about what's going on. And again, when I catch a pause, I'm like, great, let's try some feeling words. Let me just put a list in front of you of some feeling words. Let's just pick a couple and see how that feels. A lot of us understand what emotional intelligence is, but I'm not sure if we apply it, which is what you're saying about intelligence being in, the, in, in application. Yeah. And, and I love to start kind of the, the process of our own kind of emotional intelligence development with not just knowing, but even if we were to use the word like perceiving or perception, I hope that that gives us a little bit more room, especially to engage our curiosity. Mm-hmm. curiosity mm-hmm. right because we we don't always feel like that core like oh yes I, I i feel confident right in that right that our emotions can actually be really subtle and really tentative or they can be kind of a mix of things really nuanced i can feel really excited about a thing and worried about a thing and angry about a thing at the exact same time mm-hmm. about the same thing about the exact same thing and with the exact same mm-hmm. thing, if you shine it in the light slightly differently, I'm like mm. <laughs> new feeling, mm-hmm. right? And so even just this this layer of perception, and that gives us room to not always have to feel it very strongly. And we might be able to tune into some of maybe our more subtle cues. I know we use the word feeling really broadly to describe kind of all of our reactions. I like to separate, at least in these conversations emotions as kind of like the physiological response and feeling as maybe the kind of experience and the the kind of way we make meaning of that. Can you give me examples of how you would, what the distinction would that be? That would be? Yeah. So I think it's the difference between saying I am hurt versus I feel judged, right? That those two things can be the exact same moment but we might make a meaning of the emotional experience. And so I feel is often kind of the, the way we are experiencing the emotional reaction that we're having. And so in day to day, there isn't necessarily a strong reason to separate those out. Um, but as we're thinking about like skill building in these conversations, I like to slow us down and unpack them, especially when I'm working with folks together, right? Working with couples or systems because it helps us relate to one another better because we use feeling words in these really like broad, ubiquitous ways. We assume we're talking about the same thing because we all know the word, but there are quite often very different emotional underpinnings. And I see people over and over again, miss each other. Like the word upset is a really good example. I hear the word upset in my office all the time, all the time. And so when someone says they are upset, what does that mean? We actually don't know, right? To be upset technically is just to be sort of disturbed or disrupted, sort of off balance in some way. And so depending on what your context of upset is and all of the little cues that we might pick up on or the ways in which we feel like we know the other person, or how deeply entrenched we are in our own knowledge of what it means when we use the word upset. Upset could be the emotion of anger. It could be the emotion of sadness. It could be the emotion of disappointment. It could be the emotion of jealousy. It could, right? Like there's so many different emotional experiences that you could be having, but we're using this one word that kind of misses the salience. And then we lose our opportunity for some of that wisdom. Right, that embodiment in the interaction, this way of you know, Jacqueline, you talked about you know feeling seen or feeling known. Right, we we miss that. 
And I think the irony is that when we hear emotional intelligence, even though we think we know what it means, it often is like the false synonym for not being emotional, for not acting emotional. <laughs> Right. That if you are emotionally intelligent, that means that you ha- are actually like suppressing your emotions and showing up as responsible as opposed to being emotional, living in your emotion, understanding and processing that emotion can often be seen as actually not being emotionally intelligent. And so as you're talking about understanding the meaning and really clarifying and digging, I think it just opens us up to really redefine when we are saying, an, you know, an EQ, what does that mean? What does that look like? And are we shaming people for having and sharing emotion when that is actually what we should be doing as opposed to hiding our emotion and masking that under the label of emotional intelligence? Yeah, I, I totally agree with the way that the phrase ends up being used. And I think that is typically what happens when we take kind of a framework and turn it into jargon. Uh, especially when it becomes like corporate lingo, because then it just gets reintegrated into sort of like the larger cultural dogma. And we do live in a culture that really prioritizes rationality, prioritizes logic, prioritizes productivity as like hierarchical frames of being. And so then we discount, you know, lived experience as an important place of knowledge. We discount emotionality as having important information. We, yeah, we shame emotionality and sort of put it on this binary that you are either logical or emotional. You are either rational or in tune sort of with the world around you, right? We live in a technocracy. And so we kind of keep outsourcing all of our human experiences to things that are able to be digitized or, or reproduced in sort of an analog way. And so I and so yeah I I totally agree with that as sort of common a common way that emotional intelligence is being used and my hope in having this conversation is that it really opens up the significance of really being in your feelings right to be in connection with your feelings and to not discount them as less important than other forms of knowing things because we feel first Right, the ways that our bodies react to this lived experience, it goes feelings and then thoughts and then behaviors. Our feelings are kind of emotions, whether or not you're in tune with them or in connection with them, more often than not, like that is like the instinctive, kind of instantaneous physiological reaction that you have to the experience of being in your body in the world. Simultaneously, thoughts are happening, but your feelings are your 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 emotions are gonna bias your thoughts. So on a good day, you think about are typically uh, have a very different tone overall than on a not so good day. And then the more you connect your thoughts to your behavior, right, that's also going to influence. And you can certainly tell people's kind of energy when they're moving through the world. You know, sometimes the, the energy that we're picking up is actually our capacity for empathy, where we start to notice maybe micro um, expressions little tells on people, right? We can track an emotional reaction on someone's face down to a 30 second of a millisecond, right? Just a flash, a flash of something happened. And even if we don't know in specific what that feeling was, we can often tell when the mood has changed. And so that, that's a really important level of perception to have. I think that's really important information when we're having conversations or we're making decisions when we're moving through the world, trying to be known, when we're trying to feel good, when we're trying to help other people feel good. And what I hear in your definition around emotional intelligence is that there is a distinction between sharing emotions to clarify and communicate and connect versus to judge or to blame or to punish. And I think that's the distinction that I heard you say in terms of I feel judged versus I am hurt. And that's actually probably the distinction between emotional intelligence and not. It's not not having emotion. It's sharing emotion with the intention of clarifying and communicating and connecting as opposed to sharing emotion in order to blame or to judge or to punish. Yeah. And what I would also say is that like we, I don't know if we're inherently judgmental I, I don't know yet how we would get away from making judgments. We're constantly kind of analyzing and perceiving the world around us. I think that is tied into one of the ways we've learned to be safe 
in the world or have needed to be safe in the world, constantly sort of checking and trying to understand things. And I think inherently in that will be judgment. But I think it does make a difference like what we do with the judgments that we make. And can we open up space for those judgments to also be influenced by compassion? Right? Can we have whatever thoughts we had and still make room to be compassionate to others without sh- and, and not shame them? And this comes up for me often around judgment. Um, there's a, I think there's a dissonance actually. We, in one hand, we tell people not to judge us or we feel judged and that's a bad thing. And on the other hand, we will hire people because they have good judgment or we will rely on people because they have good judgment. So there's a dissonance in social dissonance around this idea of being judged. And I think what we actually mean is um, don't prosecute. Uh, when we say don't judge, I think what we mean is don't prosecute. And I think, it, it, I, I agree with you, we go about about our lives analyzing and judging and, and it is that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? You want to judge a situation, you want to have a, you know, an appropriate reaction to a situation and you only do that through good judgment. And I think when we then judge and then use those judgments as the only way without any curiosity, without any flexibility, without any sort of leeway, when we act on those judgments uh, as if they are the only conclusion that that can exist in the world, I think that's when we are running. That's when we run into like we prosecute essentially. I think that's when we lose connection, and that's when we hurt others and disconnect from others. Now, I want to invite another word into the space, especially as we, you know, will transition into talking more about eroticism, but intimacy, that same, you know, cognitive dissonance that you were talking about between we, on the one hand, want people to be non-judgmental, but then on the other hand, want people to ha- have good judgment. I think that's the same dichotomy that we experience when we talk about intimacy. I want to know you like fully and deeply and completely, but I also don't want to know anything that I don't like about you. Right? Like, I don't want to see anything in you that I don't, I don't like. I don't want you to tell me anything that I don't want to hear. And I think some of this can, can root re- back into this conversation around EQ. There are emotions that are unpleasant that we don't want to experience. And so I think when people want both non-judgment and good judgment, right, it's, it's about like where you're putting it. I don't want to feel or be judged by you. Right? Like, I want you to like, make decisions. I want you to go in the world and make judgments and judge out there, right? But don't judge me. I don't want to feel whatever it makes me feel when I'm being judged. And I I certainly want the positive outcomes of you making good choices. And certainly you can judge me if you're going to, if you're going to be nice, right? Like if you have good things to say about me, then I want all of those judgments, right? Nobody's complaining about a judgmental person who thinks you're great. Nobody's like, no, you should be (laughs) non-judgmental, right? And it's the same with intimacy, right? We want that depth of connection, but we also don't want to be seen in ways that make us feel not good. And I think us just being able to know that helps us take a lot of these things that we have these like strong kind of moral positions around. If we were to really reflect on a lot of our sort of dogma, a lot of it is about how that experience might make us feel right? The judgments or the meanings that we have connected to kind of whatever that thing is, right? Why rationality above anything else? Why honesty above anything else? Why transparency above anything else? Why, you know, there's, there's just so, there's so much room and I'm not saying either of any of those things are inherently good or bad, but ultimately all of our experiences, including sex, really tie back to how does it make me feel? Mm Mm-hmm. I think we are naturally flowing into the eroticism side of this conversation. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because it's a much less. We talked about how you know emotional intelligence is a buzzword. I think that a less commonly used phrase is erotic wisdom, and you mentioned wisdom being intuitive, which translates then for me into erotic intuition. And I see intuition as coming from within when so much of what we learn about eroticism comes from the external. So much of what we learn about what it means to be sexy has been defined for us. And I know, you know, I think about myself in my 20s in particular, 
being not fully present in a sexual experience because I was thinking about how my back was arched or what noise I was making or whether the viewpoints from wherever my partner was showed the role in my tummy or under my chin. And none of that felt sexy or erotic, but I thought that I was being sexy because that was a thing that I was shown of how I was supposed to be. And so I'm hoping you can kind of dig into that, this idea of we are taught what erotic is, but really erotic wisdom is about the intuition of our own eroticism. And I, so, yeah, I, I don't even know what the question is, except that. <laughs> Tell me your yeah. thoughts on that. Um, so I like to think about eroticism as sort of like the poetry of sex, um, right? So sex we can divide or define super broadly. I think in sort of my most expansive definition, I might call sex anything that is pleasurable for the senses sort of whatever sense that is. And that makes lots of room for like some really good hand holding to be sexual, right. Or like some really intensive eye contact to be sexual. Um, whereas in kind of larger culture, like sex is, you know, just a very limited, just not super useful definition to me. And so if eroticism is kind of the poetry of sex, then we can think of things like, or really anything that kind of arouses sexual feelings. So like, we can use words like desire and sensuality and romance in the same way that we might think of art being spread across like painting and sculpture and drama and film and literature. I like to think eroticism kind of does that. It's sort of like the aesthetics of our sexual world. I know that's a little bit woo woo. That's just the way I like to use the word. Use whatever language works <laughs> for any of you. But I, I like to think of eroticism as sort of this yeah, this sort of just like beautiful, kind of sensual. And that doesn't mean it can't be like carnal and raw and like ugly and messy and dirty. I just like the um, sort of experience of thinking of eroticism as almost like philosophical, almost like artistic. Like it's a thing that you kind of create. It's kind of a space or kind of a flow that you can tap into rather than it having to be like it is either erotic or not. Just like art, you know, whoever is experiencing it gets to decide you know, what it means and, and what its use is. And so when I extend that out to erotic wisdom, tuning us back into our inner sense of knowing. You talked about intuition. A lot of our intuition um, isn't actually this like mystical kind of like happenstance, otherworldly. I don't even know where what what we think instinct is. Uh, some of our instinct is generated directly from experience. We have done something like this before. This is familiar. There's some quality of deja vu here, and we're really, really, really fine tuned around that, especially around danger and around joy. So the things that feel kind of exciting or curiosity inducing often had either some layer of kind of mystery or intrigue that was also curiosity inspiring for us in the past, or maybe had a pleasurable outcome. So this reminds me of a thing. Or it's connected to less pleasurable experiences, things that we've heard or seen or had happen to us. And our whole bodies really are connected to that. So smell, for example, as one of our senses is really tied very strongly to memory. That's why we can have sort of smell that just feel just like full body off-putting. And you think about, you know, kind of why, and it transports you back to the first time you encountered the thing that it reminds you of. Or it can just be like really like deep, sort of soothing or calming. Like I have the smell of like old school lipstick. I don't know if that's a smell that any of you resonate with. I can remember the first time I smelled that and there's just also like on my body when I smell like old lip, like, you know, old school lipstick, it makes me think of like deep warm hugs from my grandmother who's, who's no longer alive. She passed away when I was 12, but I can feel, I can feel the presence of her love when I smell her lipstick, when I smell her lipstick, right? And so our bodies are fine tuned to all of these little, just subtle things, time of day, time of year. Sometimes the days when you're feeling bad, think back to like, what was I doing, you know, on July 29th last year or the year before, or 10 years ago. Sometimes it's your body remembering little things. And I think all of that 
matters for our intuition and that connects to our eroticism such that the more we're paying attention to all of our little subtle cues, the more that we know about ourselves and the things that feel good to us, the more able we are to then lean in to those experiences for the pursuit of pleasure. Um, just before we started this conversation, we were discussing, Jackie and I were discussing, as we do in preparation for episodes, we, we're nerdy and two of us together, just we feed, we feed the nerd, the inner nerd. And we were trying to sort of get, uh, wrap our heads around the idea of knowledge and experience and, te- I'm sorry, knowledge and, uh, and in, um, information and wisdom. And one of the things that um, that dis- that that sort of we landed on in terms of a distinction is that uh, wisdom is dis- distilled from experience. It's kind of having the experience and then from there getting learning your lessons, getting the getting sort of your insights. And I think one of the the ideas also that that wisdom comes from the good, bad, and the ugly. It doesn't really just come from good experiences or bad experiences. It's kind of living, being there being present within your experiences and extracting wisdom, extracting insight, and then making that your own, like you said, applying it to your next experience, to your lived experience. Um, I think that's kind of what I'm, what I'm hearing from you. And I think similarly in, in the erotic space, I think it's, it's being in those experiences. I think too often, especially women, I hear too often from women that talk about how they, like Jackie said, are, are preoccupied, if you will, with how they look and how they sound and how, you know, wondering, like being in the other person's head and not necessarily be in the experience so that they can extract wisdom out of it. So I think when I hear you say it's in the experience being in touch with it, I'm like, oh, like that's sometimes missing from from how we go about our erotic expression. Experiencing it, it also sounds like making note of it. Like, I think that we probably catalog the bad experiences, to your point, Effie, more than we do the joyful ones. So that when something bad happens, we're like, I can remember in the midst of a fight, something that you said, you know, four months ago when we were in the kitchen and I was making like, like those moments of like, where you wronged me, where you injured our trust, like those things come to mind right away. The moments of joy and warmth, I think we catalog less so. And so I think as I was listening to you, Shadeen, that's that's what came to me was really paying attention and taking note of what sparks joy and warmth and arousal. And and frankly, even in this moment, earlier today, my my partner, so I, I have live in two different spaces. I share spaces with two different partners separately. And um, the partner who I'm not with at the time uh, sent me a text this morning and said, you know, I, I've been thinking I would really love to cook with you, like at least once a week, like cook something that's complicated, that allows us to be in the kitchen for a long period of time and try to figure something out together. And it made me so joyful. And I said like, oh, that makes me so happy. And I kind of kept it moving. And as I was listening to you talk, I thought, why did that bring me joy? And I realized it's because my partner was like planning something for us, that there was a future intention, that they were sitting there in the present thinking about something they want to do with me in the future. And that type of planning makes me feel cared for and wanted and joyful. And I'm like, oh, so that's something I need to be paying attention to. That that sparks something in me when someone is planning in the future about us and what they want to do together, and so I want to say I appreciate that because that that tip like helped me in this moment. I mean, so thank you, and it, it brought me that awareness that yes, I'm I'm cataloging the bad, and I need to do more of cataloging the good. Yeah, and if if I might sort of center that experience, if that's okay with you for a moment, if you lean into it, then we might make a you know a hypothesis then that some of your favorite sexual experiences or some of some of the things that are pleasurable for you in sex are when you feel like someone is really being attentive or thoughtful or making you feel special or really really paying attention right like all eyes on you right that your pleasure is important in those moments and sure we might all say like oh yeah that sounds good i'd take that right that that there right there are going to be experiences that uniquely feel like okay like that is what I want. That is what I want. And we were able to get to that point by tracing right, our emotions, right? We went through this process of perception, right? So you noticed that you had a feeling about it and paying attention to that feeling. So prioritizing what you attend to, because certainly you could have focused on the content. 
So what will we cook? When will we do it? Right? A lot of us have very pragmatic brains and we're kind of groomed culturally into doing that, especially in the West. That, you know, there's all sorts of things in that message you could have been paying attention to rather than centering your emotional experience and sharing it and understanding, right? So the emotions that we have can carry a wide var- variety of meanings. And so you taking some time to slow down, like, oh, okay, I'm happy about that. Why am I happy about that? Right? Or that, that is joyful to me. Like, what, what meaning am I making of that? And then, and then we find some way to sort of manage it, right? To, to manage that feeling. Yeah, I, and that, that really um, resonates with me. I think there's also the other side of it that we sometimes catalog or make pay attention to the other person's experience and not our own. So you are, you know, in an erotic, in an erotic experience, maybe we might walk away from it. And what we take away is how the other person felt or how we made the other person feel and not necessarily go along with it, how we felt ourselves. And I think sometimes that's the other thing that we're so focused on the other person's experience, we might not even be aware of how what it was like for us. And I think being able to still sort of make room for and have sort of insight into what's going on with you during that is also also important and it can be missed. Especially for women, because we are so socialized to be the caretakers, be the the ones in service, be the ones that have to show up and and be the sexy one and, you know, be beautiful and all those doctrine that we've experienced that we can completely not keep a record of our own experience and and, and instead be fully focused on the other person's experience. And for most people that I have encountered who have sex with women or who identify as women, caretaking is actually wildly unsexy. Right. And and that doesn't mean that's true for every single person, right? It doesn't mean you're the odd person out if you're really into that. But this abandonment of self isn't good for a lot of people because it's really hard for us to caretake and also maintain our own sense of sort of self, our own awareness of self and our own commitment to self. Right? Like how do I maintain what I need in the midst of being aware of what you need? It's really tricky. It's a really delicate balance. And so often we give up ourselves in order to hyper-focus on the other without realizing that there, there is room for both, especially in an experience that we want to be mutual. Most of us want our sexual experiences to feel good for everyone who is involved. Yeah, I do agree. The caretaking piece is something we really need to be mindful of because I think, I mean, there are many reasons why it's, you know, it's wildly unsexy. I think it's also connected to parenting. It's like, it's a parenting experience and we're not supposed to fancy our parents. So when you step into the caretaker role, you're stepping into the the, the parent bucket. And and I think in, inherently something in our brains just goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like that's not, we're not supposed to be attracted to the person that's, that's taking care of us in this very particular way. Um, so I think you really need to be mindful of that. And I think you're doing yourself and the dynamic in the middle so much more service if you take care of yourself and, and be in the experience rather than abandon yourself and go into this caretaker mode. Yeah. And I think that clarity is important because I think the distinction is not not caretaking, but not caretaking with a loss of self that we all actually love to be taken care of, but not at the expense of who you are. And certainly, let me, let, let's also note that that is also some people's kink, right? So some people do actually want to be taken care of erotically in that way. And, and that's a part of their sexual expression. Um, what I hear us saying, though, is in many cases, when one loses themselves. So in those moments in my 20s, when I was paying so much attention to my folds and my arches and wasn't really fully present, that sex would have been so much better for both of us if I was really there and didn't care whether or not my legs were shaven or if I had like, you know, or, or my hair on top of my head was disheveled. Like if I was just fully in that space, that would have been better for both of us than if I was trying to really cater to the other person at the expense of myself. Right. And I, I appreciate you bringing up that point because the thing that I wanted to say in regards to that is very much that when we take these positions on with intention, it is serving the, the purpose of feeling good. 
I, when I do this by default as my way to make sure you had a good time at the expense of actually tracking whether or not this is good or right for me, that shifts the entire interaction. So absolutely, if caretaking is how I, it right, allows me to access the ways that I want to feel, right? So I want to feel powerful. I want to feel influential. I want to feel helpful. I want to feel... I want to feel special. And so part of the way that I feel special is by creating an experience for you where you feel really good about about me and about us and about this thing that I'm doing. Right? Where, wherever it is that you're coming from, it still has to come from a place, you know, of of self. And so, you know, sex is a place where I give people permission to be selfish and not selfish in like your needs don't matter. Selfish in I I care about myself, right? That I am present to me and my needs matter. My needs are important. You know, selfless sex, right, is is not the thing that's going to get your your rocks off, right? You don't get brownie points for being a martyr, right? Mm-hmm. That, you know, that that's not the thing that that is going to really allow you to feel pleasure because it's disembodied, right? Martyrdom is disembodied. You can absolutely say like I'm going to center your physical, emotional, psychological experience in this moment, but from a place of generosity, because that's what's going to make me feel good. It makes a big difference when someone is doing something and you're aware that they're not in it. You feel that. When you're connected to a person or trying to connect to a person and you just can't reach them, for a lot of us, we have lots of wounds and trauma around that. That's really painful and uncomfortable for a lot of us even if like the the motions feel good or the activity feels good we still notice that there's something missing in your eyes or are there's just something that's not connecting again that gut we pick up on micro expressions on smells on the hairs on people's arms like you can tell there are ways in which we can often tell when we are being sort of emotionally intelligent, connected to our emotional experiences allows us to also connect to the emotional experiences of others. And when we can't find that, right, that, that means something to us. That that shifts how it feels to be in this, you know, erotic space. It it no longer feels like this sort of beautiful poetry thing. It it, it often feels people often talk about feeling like performative or like duty. Right, you just did it because I, because I wanted you. You thought I wanted it, right? That doesn't feel the same for most of us. It no longer feels like, oh, you're doing this because I felt to use you know phrasing that we used earlier. You're not doing this because you're really paying attention to me or I'm really special to you. We start to do all those other judgments about what it could have actually been for. Right, you don't want me to nag you later. You want to go out with your friends. You, you just want me to go to sleep. You think, right, like you didn't do it last time. And so maybe you feel like you have to do it this time, right? Like we start to make all kinds of other meanings because we know that person wasn't doing this from like an embodied, generous place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, if you're doing it to, because you want it, and I say, when I say manipulate to manipulate this situation, I don't necessarily mean in a conscious way, but to to elicit some sort of a reaction or to maintain a connection out of duty uh, or or like what what you think that's what you should be doing. Um, there's so many reasons why we could do something that isn't necessarily in service of ourselves and an embodied experience. Um, and I think oh, you're absolutely right. You can really tell. And and at the same time, I, I have to say. I think there is room for uh, performative sex, right? I think there's room for uh, performative sex and there's there's joy and fun in doing that. And I have to say, when I got involved with the sex positive community and started going to sex parties in New York City, I saw a different version of sex that I, first of all, I start, I, there was a place, that was the place where I saw other people have real sex, real people have real sex, which is not something that many people see, right? Often we see sex in, sort of mainstream movies, which is, that's not real. And then we see sex in porn, that's not real. And maybe we might film ourselves and see ourselves have sex. Great, but that's just that's just you. There really isn't many places where you see other people, real people have real sex. And one of the, you know, the, the things that I loved about going to sex parties is like, oh, here are a bunch of people. There are 
intertwining in within themselves and really having sex and and to be able to sit back and watch that and to see them in it um and you can you can tell people who've been doing it for a while because they don't care about the arches and the folds and they're they're in it they're experiencing it and they're being fully fully self-expressed and having fun and really experiencing it and it was one of the places where i got wisdom out of other people's ex- my experience but by by watching other people um and then at the same time this idea of performative sex which was people were doing it they, because they were still getting something out of it you know they wanted to do that they wanted to sort of, they, they were expressing the the exhibitionism they were sort of being exhibitionists and kind of having this very performative sexual experiences but still in service of their pleasure and in the service of the pleasure of, of their partner in a mutual space. So I think it really boils down to intentionality and in being embodied. Whatever it might look like from the outside, I think the, the, the difference is, is your intention of how you're going about it and whether you're present and in your body and, and amidst the experience. Yeah, you know, the, the question that I always come back to is, like, how does it feel? How does it feel? Right, you can ask that during sex, but also checking in on yourself, and and that doesn't just have to be about like the exact behavior that is happening right now, but tuning in to again that wisdom place, the nuances, being able to sort of be curious about yourself, and and hopefully in a way that is non-distracting. Sure, it maybe takes you out of the present moment a little bit, in that you're not so much so focused on the connection between you and the other person but sort of doing a quick scan of yourself hopefully if we develop kind of a practice of paying attention to how we feel it is easier to do that so reconnecting this lens of sex to emotional intelligence the skill of checking in on yourself and how you are feeling and whether you make a meaning of the feeling or not is up to you so you have the emotion, maybe you turn that into sort of language around under a deeper understanding, maybe you don't, but just that process of being able to check in translates into our you know, sexual or erotic experiences and that we can also still be paying attention to how am I feeling as I'm engaging with people. And so, yeah, maybe this actual behavior doesn't feel like much, but the thing that feels good is watching other people appreciate my body that exhibition piece, right? Like, what is it that I am wanting to feel? Just like in art, as we explore different art forms, right? Again, film, dance, photography, nature. I think nature is so beautifully artistic. Like, how how do I want to feel? And then what are the things that make me feel that way? We do so much to, like, curate all these other forms of art in our lives, right? Music, and you might start to notice some of the things that the music that you like has in common. And it doesn't mean there aren't outliers that you might be into, like, you know, ska, but then also like Lady Gaga, and then also like, I don't know, some like acoustic guitar. But thinking about like, okay, like, how does this make me feel? And then how do I continue to lean into that? How do I, you know, share that with other people? How do I embrace that? How do I allow myself to have that? And how do I also say no or no thanks or not today for the things that don't represent that? How do I balance or negotiate some of the things that feel good and right to me and feel like nothing or not so good to you and vice versa? We start to create a dialogue, but it does come from that intuitive place. It becomes intuitive the more we flex that skill of knowing how we feel such that we, we kind of have a sense of, actually, yeah, pass me more loop. Tonight, maybe we'll do more, more impact, right? That we kind of have a sense of today, I'm, I'm feeling like, I don't know, some light bondage in the sun. Ooh, maybe some, some sand. Sand might be good, right? We have this sense of self that we can then lean into all of the yeses, right? And, and, and hopefully know some things about the not yeses too. Yeah, I love that. That that's really helpful because I think in the beginning, we, as we were talking through it, I was trying to figure out, okay, what's the connection? I understand these two things, and how do they pull together? And it makes sense to me now that our emotions share insights into what we want to experience in pleasure, and that we do this all with the intention of bringing all people pleasure, ourselves and whoever we're with. And 
that clearly we need to stop worrying about the folds and the arches. I think that's going to take away. <laughs> is it folds and arches I love now? That that's now become a casual. <laughs> yes, the yeah. arches and folds is going to be is going to be now part of our, our vernacular. But yeah, that makes sense to me. Emotion shed light into what we want to experience, and, and we should leverage that to co-create our pleasure with for ourselves individually, and then with with whomever, whichever partners we're with. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that critical self-judgment that you were talking about, the the ripples and folds, and in sex therapy, we call that spectatoring, right? And so think about that positionality. I am supposed to be in this experience. Instead, I am an observer, right? And a critical observer at that. So I'm not even like out here looking, being like, oh, okay, we'll just like shift that way a little bit, right? <laughs> like I'm, I'm being critical, right? In, in the world, we typically call those trolls, we're trolling our own selves yeah Yeah. people have lots of opinions and feedback uh and but are are not willing to participate in actually helping making a thing more beautiful and more useful and more pleasurable and more helpful and so really being able to either if we're right it's not always easy for us to shut kind of our, our pragmatic or critical you know minds off and so can we invite that spectator to have more self compassion? And or are there ways for us to then lean back into our bodies and not hyper focus on, right? because we're having lots of experiences, our emotions are not only the pleasurable things that we're reacting to, but also the not so pleasurable things, right? And, and at the level of physiology, everything is mostly neutral, and then we make meaning. Right? So there's sort of pain and then kind of everything else. <laughs> and so if this is not pain, but it's uncomfortable, or it's awkward, can we attend to that in a way that allows us to make a shift? And so that's that compassion for self. Okay. Like that angle doesn't work. Like it's totally fine to be like, I don't think I look good from this angle. And so I want to do something else. That's reasonable. We don't have to judge that. If part of what you want to feel in sex is like beautiful or, you know, whatever accepted, and this is making it hard for you to access self-acceptance, angle <laughs> turn over <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. right like right like whatever it is that you're attending to right like push that role out and just be like yeah you know i'm being accepted even with the roles right that you know we we can challenge whatever it is that we've internalized but being able to be in our bodies is is there's privilege in that right that it's not always an, an easy place to get to so i want to make sure as we have this conversation that i'm responsible about saying that that embodiment um i don't want it to be held as this like sort of hierarchical space in that like only the best people can do like it it is challenging especially if our our bodies have a lot of pain right or have have experienced a lot of pain there can be just a lot of risk in re-entering because to feel right the best and worst things that could ever happen to us are 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 an emotion Right. There's some really painful things that we can experience uh, in the world and in our bodies. So I, I want to name that here. And so if re-entering or being more present uh, is, is challenging, or if you don't yet have maybe the safety or the support to you know, tolerate unpleasant feelings, uh, I just want to name that, that that is also something that can be worked on, worked on gently. You don't have to be all in, and there can be some feelings that you're just not ready to re-experience or re-encounter. Um, but a, a place that we might be able to start, even if we are still very much in that spectatory kind of judgy place, is practicing self-compassion as a way for us to make it safer to approach ourselves and to make it more possible for us to trust the things that we know rather than just critiquing. So much to think about. As we were coming into this, um, Jackie and I were chatting and we were just like, we really wanted to understand. We we're trying to wrap our heads around it. And and we sort of just like, we're like, okay, we'll just lean into this and and we'll explore and, and do what we do best, which is turn on our curiosity and ask all the questions. And you've done such a beautiful job of guiding us and and explaining and unpacking, sort of leading us through this journey and really getting us to understand both what the connection is between uh, emotional intelligence and, and erotic wisdom and and why it's so important and how we were going, we need to to really connect those things and, and experience them and, and work on them. And that's one of the things that, that we're going to hear from you on Wednesday. Uh, but before I go into talking about um, what's to come on Wednesday, 
I have a question for you, Shadeen. I w- like asking this to our guests. Besides all this beautiful, interesting, insightful, deep topics, um, what are you curious about? Oh, I love that question. So my training is systems training. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. So we, we look a lot at sort of the relational dynamics between folks. And I'm finding myself more and more curious about what that looks like in like a movement space. The, the way that I approach justice has, has very much to do with relational and interpersonal dynamics. And that has tended to be sort of on maybe in, in sort of like pockets. So like, you know, a particular business or in a family or, you know, in a pod. Um, but I'm thinking a lot more about like what that sort of lens might mean for us as we think about like calling in and calling out and calling on and like deplatforming uh, and like trans- transformational justice and, you know, restoration and, and all of these big words that we use. I, I'm really thinking about like what what that looks like or what that could look like from a relational place. Yeah, that's interesting. We This has recently been a trend for us. Um, we are speaking to some very awesome women who are thinking about the big picture macro dynamics and bringing them right into the micro um, relational home dynamics and, and sort of seeing what the connections are. Recently, we spoke to Angie Gunn, also a, a therapist, and she unpacked for us Though she sort of echoed oppression and in the big picture into the way that it shows up, it can show up in uh, in our relationships and the power dynamics and sort of oppression and power dynamics that we're currently protesting about um, in the streets and how actually these dynamics show up in relation relationships and in the family in the homes and that was super interesting. So I, when I hear you say that, I'm like, oh, this is another one of those, and it's it's so deeply interesting. And it's fascinating because it's the other perspective of that. Yeah, right. it's how do we take the lessons of the work that we're doing individually and within the home and bring that to movement and bring yeah. that to the streets. Yeah. yeah, because that's where change happens is in relationship. When we really can listen and understand each other is when that, that change will happen. So yes, as you learn, please come back and teach us. <laughs> that sounds yeah, bad. Now I am curious. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, absolutely. Great. that's great. That's my favorite part of curiosity. It's bad. Yes, you're speaking our language. You're speaking our language. And uh, if you're interested in connecting to your needs and the needs of your partner, if you're ready to feel awake, charged, and sexual alive, then join us on Wednesday, August 19th at 8 p.m. Eastern as Shadeen will guide us through emotional intelligence as erotic wisdom. Maybe you've had an idea of what you want to experience sexually, but you've had a hard time in actually experiencing pleasure. Maybe you had pleasurable moments, but you're unsure how to recreate them. Maybe you're unsure where to begin, but know that you want, to, you want and deserve to feel good. No matter where you are on your journey, in this workshop, you will learn opportunities to build your emotional intelligence, amplify your erotic wisdom, develop language for how to share this knowledge with others, to share in your pleasure. In this session, we'll be recognizing our personal obstacles and dis- distractions to pleasure, mapping our emotional landscape, exploring our core desires and what they teach us about our erotic needs, drawing our erotic calling cards to share with our potential lovers and existing partners. You can get tickets as always on our Facebook page, our Instagram bio, on our website by searching We Are Curious Foxes wherever you are and whichever platform you're on. And if you're not able to join the workshop or if you are listening from the future, not to worry, you can watch a recording from the workshop on our Patreon. In fact, as a Patreon member, you have access to all the video recordings from our in-person and our virtual events and conferences, as well as free tickets, discounted tickets, exclusive events, and more. You can find us at Patreon at We Are Curious Foxes. If you want to find out more about Shadeen Francis and her work, you can go to her website, www.shadeenfrancis.com and on her Instagram at Shadeen Francis LMFT. You can follow us at We Are Curious Foxes also on Facebook and Instagram. If you like what you are hearing, then please like, review, and share the podcast. It makes a difference. Our goal is to change the noise. And we try to do that in all the places that you can watch and listen and read and attend. 
If you're interested in a topic that you would like us to explore in the show, give us a call and we may play your question. We are going to be exploring two things in the coming month. One is consensual non-monogamy 101. So if you're interested in entering into or opening up your relationship, Effie and I are going to co-facilitate a session just on that. We're going to be exploring that in the podcast. So if you have questions about opening up, then give us a call and let us know. Our number is 201-870-0063. We're going to be doing another conversation for those of us who have been in this dynamic for a while and we have hashtag poly problems. We're going to be talking about scheduling and talking about all sorts of things that get in the way sometimes of our open relationships. And so if you have questions or if you have hit roadblocks in your open relationship, then you can give us a call, share some stories and questions, and we may play them on an upcoming podcast. Again, that number is 201-870-0063. And as always, you can reach out to us, share ideas, and tell us which episode have helped you in your journey. And you can do that by emailing us at listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. And thank you again, Shadeen, for joining us. This has been real insightful and we're excited to take a deeper dive into the workshop on August 19th. And thank you for listening, Foxes. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.